Good morning. Good morning. Uh, glad that you're here today. We are continuing our study in the book of Acts. If you have been with us, it has been a journey. And we are now to the place of a total head-to-head -head cultural explosion. It is a head-on collision, if you will, between what the Jews have come to believe concerning salvation, which is that only by being a Jew can you be saved, to this Roman centurion, who will be the first Gentile convert, this Roman centurion who was thought so poorly of by the Jews, they thought Messiah was coming back to overthrow Rome and overthrow the Roman Empire and to lead them into a place where the Jewish people would rule and reign. And suddenly this thing happens where Gentiles receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter is about to pull his hair out, just to be frank. Peter just doesn't know quite what to think about this. God is going to challenge Peter on every level through this. If you remember where we left off last time was that Peter had gone to this place in Joppa and moved into the house and staying with a man who was a tanner. Which, who was perpetually, ceremonially unclean because he handled dead things all the time. So he moves in, and besides that, a tanner's place of business always stunk, always smelled. They would take the brains of animals and boil them and take that fluid from the boiled brain and mix it with urine, and that's what they use as a tanning material, so you can imagine the smell that permeates this guy's place. And anybody staying there, that's what they were going to smell like. We were camping a week or so ago, or a couple weeks ago now, um, down in Santa Rosa, and the grandchildren were going to come over one night, and they always want s'mores, so about... Three o'clock in the afternoon, I built a fire, and I stood out there at the fire all afternoon, and I got covered in smoke. And so when I came in, Elba goes, you smell like smoke. Look, I didn't smell it. That's sort of the tanner situation. The tanner, after a while, he doesn't smell this. He doesn't even realize he's there. But Peter's moved into the house, and now he has the stench of a tanner on him. Boy, for a Jewish boy, this is horrible. For a Jewish boy, this is promoting the fact that he's been around a tanner a lot. And so he's become, in the eyes of the Jews, ceremonial and clean himself. Now God's going to move him from that house about 35 miles south by the, by the total sovereignty of God, we'll see that in the message this morning, is going to move him about 35 miles south and take Peter and continue to whittle away at this cultural clash in Peter's life. Because now he's going to present him with not only the fact that he's, he's, has the stench of a tanner on him, but he's going to present him with a Gentile that's ready to be saved. And Peter just doesn't know quite what to think about this. Now, if that wasn't enough, God's going to send a vision to Peter of, and tell him in this vision, here's some animals. You're hungry, Peter. Here's some animals in this vision. Here's God's message to him. Kill and eat. And Peter's going, but these animals are not stuff that I'm supposed to eat as a good Jewish boy. So you see what God's doing by where he's living what he's eating, who he's bringing to the Lord, he's beginning to work on Peter. Amen. Now, it is interesting, too, that in the town, Caesarea 
Maritima, which is where Peter is going to be sent from Joppa, within Caesarea, you'll remember that back a few chapters, there was this guy by the name of Philip who went out and witnessed to a eunuch. Philip becomes Philip the evangelist. Philip's already living in Caesarea. So why does God go to this captain of the guard and tell him to send for Peter 35 miles away? Why didn't he just send to the next block and get Philip to come over and deliver a message? I'm going to give you a stranger one than that before this is all over. And part of the message is today that it's not because this captain of the guard needed to hear from Peter necessarily, but Peter needed to go there for Peter. Now here's what I want you to see as we get into this today. I'm I'm giving you sort of the punchline before we start. You ready? Here it is. We, particularly as Americans, we think, okay, the goal is for me to go from here to that camera. Shortest distance between two points is a straight line. That's how I'm going. Here's here's my mission. And God's going, but I want you to go by way of the back of the church, and I want you to speak to these people over here. And then I want you to go outside, and I want you to wander around the parking lot out here and walk the streets of Redway. And then I want you to come back in and go to the camera. That's the most productive way between two points. And sometimes God gives us those ways to walk that are not, in our mind, the most efficient. Are you with me? Anybody ever been on a journey? You go, well, what do you want me to go there for, God? So here we are. Let's go to the text this morning. Chapter 10, begin in verse 1. Here's the, this place of Caesarea. At Caesarea, there was a man by the name of Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. Some of your translations may say Italian cohort. Let me give you a little background here. This Cornelius was a centurion. Now, who is a centurion? Centurion is, the, is sort of a captain of a hundred men. That's why century, centurion, get it? He's the captain of a hundred men. There are six of these centurion groups within each one of these regiments. So how many in the regiment? 600. And there are 10 of the regiments in a larger group of, uh, uh, that it, now there's 6,000. So, but the centurions are, they're the backbone of this whole fighting force. Now here's, here's the thing that, about centurions. Centurions are proud men. They're typically wealthy men because they're paid well. They are brave. They are fierce. They are steady, consistent, never fail. That's how they're trained, and that's how they're chosen. They don't go along for a little while and then quit. Why? Because they got a hundred men under them, and if this group of a hundred fails, maybe the next group of a hundred is going to fall right behind them. So the centurions are the backbone of this fighting force. And centurions, interestingly, are always presented positively biblically. You remember this, it was a centurion that once came to Jesus and he says, I have this servant in my house who is at death's door and, and, I, and I want you to heal this person. And Jesus says, well, fine, I'll come to the house and, 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 and heal her. And the centurion says, listen, I captain men, I know. 
I don't have to be there. All I have to do is speak the word, and the word goes out, and that's done because I'm a man of authority, and I know you're a man of authority over everything. Amen. So all you have to do is just speak the word. And what does Jesus say? Publicly in front of all of Israel, here's what he says. Never have I seen such faith in this Gentile centurion. And I've never seen such faith in all of Israel. You good Jews, listen to me. He understands. And he spoke the word and she was healed. And you'll remember there was a centurion too at the cross. And who was he? He looked at the Jesus on the cross and he saw he had seen a lot of men die on a cross. And he looked at Jesus and says, this surely is the Son of God. He saw how he died. This surely is the Son of God. So every time centurions, these men, highly trained, highly disciplined, focused, faithful to their charge, consistent throughout their, their service, always there, this centurion is over in Caesarea, and again, 35 miles south of Joppa, where, where Peter is, and he, he is over this Italian as is in what this thing called the Italian Regiment. He and all of his family were devout God-fearers, or God-fearing, and he gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. Now, let's talk about this centurion. If you, go, if you would go to Caesarea today, you will see the ruins of a temple. That temple was built on the ruins of another temple, which this centurion financed. He gave the money for the temple to be built. So this centurion has been faithful. He is a God-fearer. What is a God-fearer? A God-fearer, that's a technical term here. The God-fearers were those who were essentially Jewish believers, and they had done everything, and they could go to, to, the, to the synagogue, they could hear the worship, they couldn't go in during the sacrificial times, because one thing, they were uncircumcised. They had done everything except be circumcised, but they've gone, okay, you know, you circumcise babies at eight days old, I'm 33, I'm not, not going there. In Africa, we've seen the circumcision ceremonies. They take young men, early 20s, and circumcise them. Leave them up on the hillsides, and they cover them in a red uh, blanket. So you know what's happened there. And there'll be two or three or four or five, sometimes ten together, sitting up on the hillsides. And regularly, a healthy percentage of those die from infection. That's, it's, it's, a, it's a brutal thing, particularly when it's not sterile. And so this centurion had done everything in the way of Jewish worship except be circumcised. That's, that's who he is. He and all of his family were devout God-fearers. They had done what? He had given generously to those in need. He had prayed to God regularly. And he has... A relationship with God. Now, I want you to notice what's happening here. Don't miss this. He is seeking the truth concerning God. Are you with me? Every time someone is seeking the truth concerning God, God sends somebody to them. Amen. Yep. We've seen it on the mission field. This answers the question, well, what about those that are genuinely seeking God but have never heard of Jesus. If they're genuinely seeking the truth of God, I know, because I have seen it, God will send someone to them. Sometimes he's even sent me. I've heard the story over and over again from, from young people in Africa. I've been praying that somebody would send and I could know the truth about God. And then I got invited to this little hut in the middle of a black township 
And I went there, and here's this white guy preaching the gospel. And I hear about Jesus, and then they, they actually gave me a Bible in my own language afterwards. And I came to know who Jesus is. So don't tell me somebody out in the middle of the bush can't be reached. I've seen them walk three days and three nights just to hear the gospel and didn't know what they were coming for. God always sends somebody to those who are seeking the truth concerning him. So they were praying. He and his family were devout. They were praying to God regularly. One day, about three in the afternoon, this is the ninth hour, about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. This is the centurion, Cornelius. He distinctly saw an angel of God. This is not a dream. He is fully awake. He sees a vision. He saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. This trained centurion is shocked by the appearance of a heavenly being, and just like you or I, he was afraid. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and devout soldier and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and he sent them to Joppa. Again, just 35 miles north of where he is, but that's about a two-day journey just to get there, about a two-day journey back. And again, I ask you the question, why not just send for Philip the evangelist across town? Why didn't the angel just get, present the gospel to Cornelius? Because God has reserved that in all but one case biblically, which we'll get to in Revelation 14, by the way. That's my promotion for you to come. In the final times, the final, final act of human history, God allows an angel to preach the gospel. But that's the only time. Every other time, it's, he sends men and women to go share the gospel of Jesus Christ with somebody else. Every single time. That's reserved for us. Yeah. It's a privilege for us. And it says that the, the Bible says that the angels look into that with great interest because they're, they're blown away by the fact that we have that privilege. Do we ever look at it as a privilege is what I would ask. He told them everything that had happened to them and he sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. Now notice the timing of this. He's there, he doesn't know this group's coming and God's going to send him a vision. He's hungry, he wants something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance, and he saw heaven open, and something like a large sheet being let down to by earth by four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles, which was strict prohibition, you couldn't eat reptiles if you were a Jew, on the earth, and certain birds of the air that they also can eat. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill, and eat. What's Peter's response? Surely not, Lord. May I just stop right there. This is a direct contradiction of terms in a simple statement. You cannot say no and Lord when the Lord is instructed yes. He is either Lord or he is not. If he's Lord and he says do it, the answer is always yes. If he's not the Lord, if, it, if he said surely not, no way, dude, he would have been more correct. 
he says, no, Lord, that's not in my tradition. Now, here's where tradition and scripture come head to head. And listen, it's not just among the Jews. We in the church have developed our own set of traditions as well. There's nowhere that he was told that he couldn't do certain things except in the traditions of the Jews. But God says, get up, kill, and eat. And here's what he says. The voice spoke to him a second time. What God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. Listen, God's got you living in a tanner's house. You stink, boy. You already got it all over you. Do you not get it, what I'm doing to you? I'm chipping away at who you have become, which is more rooted in tradition than scripture. And I want you to see who God is and what God's getting ready to do, Peter, through you. The voice spoke to him a second time, said, what God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. This happened three times. And immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of this vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not, and look, watch what he says to him. Watch what, the, what this says to him. Do not hesitate to go with them, <coughs> for I have sent them. Go downstairs. Whatever they say, wherever they're going to take you, just go with them. Don't ask any questions. Right? Peter went downstairs and he says to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. He asked a question. Why have you come? Always questioning. Don't you love Peter? Peter, let, let me just tell you, I relate to Peter so much. I just, I just think, praise God that I, we've got the message of Peter in the, in the New Testament because it gives me hope. I understand Peter. The men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing, there's that term again, God-fearer or God-fearing man, who is respected by all the Jewish people. So now this Gentile, who is a God-fearer, he says, is respected by the Jewish people. He is faithful in the synagogue. He is faithful to come and worship. He is a faithful man of prayer. A holy angel told this centurion to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Okay. This reminds me of a time that we're doing a memorial service this afternoon. The first, first memorial service I ever did was in Africa. And so we get to Africa. We hadn't been there 24 hours yet. We're sitting in the pastor's house. Here came a runner, what they call a runner. Doesn't knock on the door, he just runs into the house. He goes, we're sitting, eating dinner. He goes to the, to the black pastor there and he whispers in his ear. And the pastor gets up and he says, we must finish our meal and we must go. Then he walks around the table and he, he speaks to me and he says, Pastor Dave, we are going to a funeral and you are preaching the funeral. And I, I, I wasn't a pastor at that time. He called me Pastor Maruti. That's what they call it, Maruti. Maruti, we're going to a funeral and you're preaching the funeral. And I'm going, brother, no way. I've never even preached an American funeral, let alone an African funeral. No way. No way, Lord. Not doing that. I'll tell you a little bit more about that experience this afternoon at 3 o'clock because it's relevant. A 
holy angel told him to have you come to his house so that you could hear what you have to say. On the way to the funeral, I will tell you this much, on the way to the funeral in Africa, the pastor was good enough to prompt me on what to expect and what was expected of me and to train me up briefly about what I needed to do as to be part of this funeral. God was training me up. God is going to speak to Peter about what he needs to do on, on his way. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guest. The next day Peter started out with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa, that's it's where he's been staying, are going to go along. He's got an entourage going with him. Isn't it not nice, Pastor Tom, when you have an entourage go with you somewhere? A group of people that go with you to minister. That's the church. That's what the church is all about. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and friends, his close friends. So Cornelius has called all the people to the house because he's got the timing in his mind when they're going to be back. And they come back and they walk in and he's got a group of people for Peter to talk to. He wants the message to go out to his friends about whatever this man of God's got to say. Boy, have we had such good friends today. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. Whew. And Peter made him get up. So he said, stand up. He said, I, I am only a man myself. Don't worship me. All the way through the scriptures, we see the saints of God and men of God refusing worship. Jesus over in, I think it's Luke 11, says, tells his followers not to worship his mother, not to pray to her. We, we've, got, we've got to think on these things and about these things. So Peter is, is, is kind of freaked out by all of this, and he says, no, 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 don't worship me. Talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with Gentiles or visit him. <laughs> Greetings, brothers. <laughs> but then he's got, he does continue the message. To Peter's credit, here's what he says. But God, love those two words, don't you? But God has shown me that I should not call anything man imp any man impure or unclean. Boy, that is a stiff thing to get out of the mouth of a good Jewish boy. But you see God beginning to change Peter's heart, beginning to work on him, to make him usable and pliable in his hands. So when I was sent out for, I came without raising any objection. He did ask a question, though. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, four days ago I was in my house praying. At this hour, at three in the afternoon, suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately and it was good for you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything that the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now recognize, and I think God is beginning to, to reveal to Peter, drop the scales from Peter's eyes, just as he did from Paul's eyes. Drop the scales from Peter's eyes to, to show him and to cause Peter, Peter's bound to remember at this point. There was a message Jesus delivered, and Peter was there, where Jesus said, Peter, I have other flocks that must also hear the word. And he sends Peter to go tend to one of these other flocks. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right or, or follow his commands. 
You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Now this is revelation to these God-fearing Jews. What's Peter doing? Peter is connecting the dots. You've heard through the Old Testament all the prophets of God say that Messiah was coming. You've also heard over here, on the other hand, of all the works of Jesus Christ and the things that he is doing. I want you to lay these over the top of one another and see if they don't fit. That's what Peter's doing here. He is saying, here's the prophets, prophecies, and here's the Messiah. Do they fit? He says, you've heard of this, and it's through Jesus Christ who is Lord of all. Peter could have added, even me. You know what has happened throughout Judea. You've heard the stories of, all, of what Jesus is doing. You've seen it. You've heard about it. And in Galilee, and after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under his power, the, healing all that was under the power of the devil, because God was with him. And once again... I want just to bring it to your attention. God was doing miracles through this Jesus, Messiah. And he's done miracles through Peter as an apostle for, the, for one purpose, and that is the greater miracle of the salvation of men. Okay, I got your attention now through this miracle. You ready? Boom. Here comes a greater miracle, the salvation of men. We are witnesses of everything he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. You've heard about these things, but I'm an eyewitness. My entourage here, they're eyewitnesses to this stuff. They killed this Jesus by hanging him on a tree. Accursed is the man who hangs on a tree. That's why the Jews didn't want anything to do with Jesus. He was accursed. Couldn't be Messiah because he was accursed. And here's the rest of the story. He was accursed for you and I. He paid the price for our sins and was accursed for you and I. That's the completion of the story of Jesus Christ. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testified about him, and everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Are you listening? Everyone who believes on him will receive forgiveness for their sins through his name. That's the message that Peter is bringing to this Gentile home who has heard that only by Jewish blood can you genuinely be saved, or only by Jewish indoctrination can you be saved. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, those that they had called dogs. Now anointed with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. That was a sign in the early church that they had indeed been saved. Then Peter said, Can anyone keep these people these Gentiles of this centurion house, the Roman guard, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Let's go back and notice just a couple of things. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Mark 7 is an affirmation of that as well. God has said to us, you have a mission. 
And some of us have said to him, say no, Lord, no, Lord, no, Lord, when we ought to be saying yes, Lord. And it ought to be a priority. Nothing is unclean. Verse 18 of Mark 7 and verse 18 and 19 say this. And he said to them, Are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into a man from the outside cannot defile him? Because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach, and it's eliminated. Thus he declared all clean food, all food clean. Do you get it? God had predicted that the Gentiles would come in. He told them. Here's all the passages from the Old Testament (coughs) where God had told the prophets all the way through, Gentiles are going to be part of this deal. Why did did the leaders of the synagogues, why did these men not say this was part of the plan? Because this isn't a very popular message. This is the problem of taking only a piece of scripture and looking at it. Ripping it from its context and looking at it out of context. One of the guys from the mission, the guy that's going to be speaking here, I hope, Saturday, Lee, came to, up to me last time I was there, and he and I have been having this conversation openly back and forth in front of everybody else about a certain doctrinal position. And so I, I told him, I said, Lee, we're not going to conclude that conversation in front of everybody here until you read a book. Here's a book I want you to read. Now, I just, I gave that about a 15% chance of happening. But the last time I was there, he came up to me between sessions and he said, Pastor Dave, so what do you think about what John Lennox says about this, this, and this? And I said, well, Lee, what do you think? He says, he's in context, isn't he? I said, yeah. And context says that this is how, what this must now mean. I said, yep. He says, so you agree with him? I said, yep. Real big smile. I do too. <laughs> Why? Because the scriptures say so. Isaiah 49, for example, it is too small a, thi- it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. It's too small a thing just to think of saving the Jews. I will also make a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Not just Israel, not just Jerusalem, but to the ends of the earth. Judea, Samaria, Samaritans? Oh, no. Mixed breed Jews and pagans? No, surely not, Lord. Surely not, Lord. Get it? God was shifting from the old covenant and to economy to a new economy. The restraint bothering Peter was not even in the Old Testament. It was in the Talmud, which was a collection of the Jewish leaders' writings. Yet based on it, Peter was willing to say, by no means, Lord, When we say no to the Lord because of our traditions rather than Scripture, and and you'll never have to say no to the Lord according to Scripture, if it is indeed the Lord speaking to you. The law grew out of rabbinic tradition. The same thing's happening in the church today. It's not not any different. We've, We've developed a whole lot of traditions and a whole lot of churches all over the world that have nothing to do with scripture. And part of part of our listen to me, part of our mission as Christ followers, not just as pastors, but as Christ followers is to begin to make distinction between what is scriptural and what is just tradition that has been labeled Christian. Is it scriptural? These things that have been given to many of us are just arbitrary absolutes. We've been given them as absolutes, but they're they're arbitrary. They have nothing to do with Scripture, and we need to make distinctions between them. 
they leave us, these traditions, often leave us saying, no, Lord. We couldn't do that. The story is told of Mahatma Gandhi. And Gandhi was enamored with the teachings of Jesus Christ. Listen to this because I'm closing with this. Gandhi was enamored with the teachings of Jesus Christ, particularly the Sermon on the Mount. He, just, he had studied that sermon and he, was, he says, because of what I have learned there, I'm thinking of changing and accepting Christ and becoming a Christian. And so one Sunday morning, Gandhi gets up, comes to a church, starts to walk in, and he's greeted at the back door by a greeter of the church, an official greeter of the church, that greets him and tells him, look, because of the darkness of your skin, you might be more comfortable going down the road to this other place where your kind worships. Part of the reason he was, he was interested in the Christianity is because it did not have a caste system. And he came away from that experience and he, he wrote later on, I have learned that Christians also have a caste system. And so I'm just going to stick with my Hindu faith. Oh, the brokenness if that person had ever understood who he said no, Lord, to. These things become barriers between us and non-Christians. We can't allow traditions to keep us from witnessing to non-Christians, being around non-Christians, taking opportunities with non-Christians. Verse 43. All the prophets testified about him, that is the Messiah, and everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came and filled the house and that heard the message. And God wants today to do that same thing. Perhaps, perhaps even there's somebody here that's never accepted Christ. You've been to church. You've heard the message. You've associated with Christians, and you think that just kind of rubs off and protects you somehow. This is an individual, personal decision that every single person must make. And what Christ is revealing to you, even today, is that he is Messiah. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the one that they've been looking for throughout all of history, and he is saying, my message is available to you Gentile today. If you fall into that category, I would just invite you to pray a simple prayer. Tell God that you know you're a sinner. That you know he sent Messiah Jesus Christ to be your Savior. That you accept him as Lord and Savior of your life and that you will not say no, Lord. And that you want to receive him as Savior of your life. And here's the promise of the, of the, of the gospel. That if you do that, his promise is, you will be saved. That's the message. You will be saved. Let's pray. Father God, I, I thank you today for, for your message of hope in the centurion. I thank you for giving us the story of this first Gentile convert where Holy Spirit came and fell on the entire house that heard and that they were saved. I thank you, Lord, that even Gentiles like me, sinners like me, can be saved. I ask you to move on hearts and minds even at this moment and make a decision that they would make a decision to accept what you have revealed to them today. And I pray, Lord, for your guidance and direction for each person that does that, that you would protect them, keep them safe from harm, and make them inquisitive about your word. And we pray these things in Christ's name.